Semper Vivi here with you for the next hour, talking professional wrestling and mixed martial arts, something we do every single day here on the Sports Byline Broadcasting Network. And the byline is everywhere, too. iHeart, tune in, sportsbyline.com, over the air affiliates, Sirius XM 156, podcast or video streaming on Twitch and YouTube. However, you're joining me today. I just want to say thank you and special thank you for those of you listening over American Forces Radio on this Memorial Day weekend. The big boss man, Brian Alvarez, is in Las Vegas as I speak, which means I can do this. Blueberry Red Bull. Hopefully he's not hanging out with the great Ocon because if he is, he'll have a lot of explaining to do once he gets home. Brian and Dave Meltzer and many others are in Vegas for the F4W Online Wrestling Observer Convention and, of course, AEW Double or Nothing. And let me get a little bit of house cleaning out of the way uh, at the jump here. Brian and Dave will be holding a Q&A Saturday morning, 11 a.m. Pacific, at the Silver Nugget Casino in Las Vegas. The meet and greet is sold out, but there are tickets left for the Q&A. And I believe the dinner at Texas de Brazil or Tejas de Brazil, uh, the steakhouse. So for all the information on anything that has to do with the F4W convention and the festivities this weekend, go to at F4W convention on Twitter. The hashtag they're going to use is F4WCon22. And I got a lot to get into today. Smackdown is tonight. Ronda Rousey against Raquel Rodriguez has been announced. There's a live rampage, which depending on when you are listening to the feed of this show has popped possibly already happened and a ton of news not the least of which is new japan holding a press conference to discuss their very tense relationship that they're having right now with kota abushi so there's a lot to get into i I thought today i was just going to be talking about double or nothing and the best of the super juniors but a bunch of news has popped up a bunch of injury news to get into jeff jarrett is back with wwe and a whole lot more so we're going to get it all started when i get back from break wrestling observer live mike semper vivi wrestling observer live you know we do this show for an hour at a time every day but if you want us 24 7 you can try to find us on twitter at semper vivi the timeline for this website is at wonf4w the broadcasters at sports byline usa and if you love pro wrestling, at Mid-Atlantic Pod. Brian Alvarez is not here, but his Twitter is at Brian Alvarez. I'm not sure if he has started tweeting out some of his adventures on his trip to Las Vegas, including trying to fend off Ed in San Antonio. And I'm going to go through the Double or Nothing card today and give some of my thoughts on what could happen. As This is going to be the last time you hear or see me until Monday. Uh, actually, Tuesday, I think it is. Actually, Tuesday, I think Sports Byline will be taking a nap on Monday. And I don't blame them on Memorial Day weekend. But uh, if it is a replay... Uh, then I'll be back on Tuesday alongside Brian and Saturday morning. Mr. Jim Valley is going to be in this chair, 1 p.m. Eastern time, 10 a.m. Pacific. And then Andrew Zarian will take it over on Sunday evening, 6 p.m. Eastern, 3 p.m. Pacific. And he'll take you into the start of the pay-per-view. And uh, I'll get to that a little later on because... I woke up this morning to the news of a press conference New Japan was holding about Kota Ibushi and Bushi Road President uh, Taka- uh, Takaki Kidani and New Japan President Takami Obari uh, had this press conference. Uh, it's been a bizarre public feud uh, for those of you who've been paying attention between the two sides. Two and a half weeks ago, Abushi tweeted a message exchange between he and New Japan official Yasuki Kikuchi, just remember that name, uh, Kikuchi, about Abushi appearing at Taka Mikinoshu's Just Tap Out event in March. The comments Abushi tweeted included New Japan's handling of his shoulder injury last October, where he felt pressure to perform and Kikuchi suggestively asking if Abushi wanted his release. Obari explained that New Japan's uh, side of the events at this press conference, and the full transcript of this is up on New Japan's website. It's linked through WrestlingObserver.com. If you go up there, too, I'm going to give you an abbreviated version of it as much as I can because I'm not going to spend the entire hour on the thing, but 
goes like this. Kota Ibushi is a wrestler exclusively contracted to New Japan Pro Wrestling. As such, it is understood that in order to devote full attention to New Japan matches and associated events, he is required to inform and receive express permission from New Japan before outside appearances. On March 4th, in breach of the terms of his contract, Mr. Ibushi made an appearance seconding wrestlers at a Just Tap Out event. Kikuchi is responsible for contacting various wrestlers contracted to New Japan but he also has a long personal history with Mr. Ibushi that extends far more uh, that extends far before him becoming exclusively contracted talent. Kikuchi contracted Mr. Obushi in the belief that Mr. Obushi's actions in breach of his contract were taken deliberately to persuade New Japan to terminate his agreement with him. Perceiving this as a betrayal of personal trust established over a number of years between Kikuchi and Ibushi, Kikuchi's messages were sent in an emotional state as a result. Not wanting to lose the services of Kota Obushi in such a manner and wanting to find out his true mental state and opinions on this matter... I arranged a meeting with Mr. Ibushi at his personal training facility on May on March 31st. Abari then would talk about the two working out together, how Ibushi had said his shoulder is not where he needs it to be to perform, and how impressed he was with Ibushi as an athlete. And this is where Obari also determined that Ibushi, by appearing on the Just Tap Out show, was not going to be in breach of his contract and only received a reprimand. Obari then went on to say, at the point of our meeting, I did not know the exact wording or particulars of Mr. Ibushi's text conversation with Kikuchi, and as a result, did not offer a proper apology for the content of the conversation. Several weeks later, on May 10th, screenshots of the conversation were made public. I have since learned that those tweets were made when Mr. Ibushi was acting in a state of concern for his mother, with mental distress being caused by this situation. Mr. Ibushi told me that after discussing the details of the situation with his mother on May 8th, she attempted suicide on May 9th and suffered a broken bone in her back as a result. A meeting was held on May 10th, including our company's legal staff, in order to understand the particulars of the situation and to determine the best possible course of action for both New Japan Pro Wrestling and Mr. Ibushi. We determined that the said best course of action would be to directly meet with Mr. Ibushi to formally apologize and hear one another's opinions before making a public announcement should one be deemed necessary. At that point, Obari closed by saying that he and Kidani were able to meet with Ibushi and said that both Ibushi and Kikuchi would be reprimanded but remain with the company, and he apologized to the fans for their concerns. Sounds good? Not all of it was in the moment, because not long after the press conference ended, Kota Obushi tweeted that he was upset over the fact that the company initially glossed over the situation with his mother, which was the whole reason he began tweeting about all of this in the first place. So they had to go back and amend the statement that I just read. So... I am sure Dave Meltzer is going to have more on this in the next show that he does with Brian. He writes about it in this week's newsletter, although obviously not this information, which came out after deadline today. New Japan, uh, very apologetic, and obviously the olive branch to Kota Ibushi has been handed Apparently it was yesterday with the meeting with, uh, with Obari. Uh, so, uh, We'll see what happens. This is a very important story because of the stardom that Kota Ibushi has over in Japan, his run with New Japan, his contract with them, and then also his relationship in the States with Kenny Omega and how this could play into a New Japan AEW relationship. There's all those professional things, as well as the fact that this has caused great mental stress on Kota Obushi, and he may not be in the best of uh, mental states right now for a variety of reasons, not the least of which is his mother. Uh, Dave Meltzer talked about on Wrestling Observer Radio not all that long ago about the fact that when you are an athlete at the level of Kota Obushi, when you are not able to train and you look at Kota Obushi, a guy who looks like he is carved out of stone, you know the type of, of, of care he takes of his body, uh, how he feels 
it's got to be driving him nuts. And the fact that could, that Ibushi is a character anyway, and is quite the unique personality. You know, I, I, my biggest concern is his mental state right now, because again, this, this whole situation with his mother is just, it, it is a, a, a sad situation, but we'll have to see what, what happens going forward here. A good sign, at least from a public relations point of view, in my opinion, from New Japan to come out, have this conversation after having a conversation with Kota Ibushi and to make sure that the public knows that New Japan Pro Wrestling values the services and the mental health of Kota Ibushi. So, well, just have to see what happens. You never have to to wait and see what happens with Jeff Jarrett for too long because at some point he is going to be involved in the wrestling business and... It has been reported today on Friday, PW Insider, that according to multiple sources, the former six-time WWE Intercontinental Champion, Tag Team Champion, and European Champion is coming home as a high-level executive. That was the quote. High-level executive on the live event side of the business. He's going to begin next week. The 54-year-old Jared is a 2018 inductee into the WWE Hall of Fame and had returned to the company as a producer in January of 2018. 19 that didn't last but uh this year alone <laughs> see the, the the wall here i got a one of these beautiful drawings here behind me uh he appeared at gcw's uh hammerstein show as well as some other shows for gcw feuding with effie in addition to appearing as a as a referee in the nwa as well as making appearances for triple a in mexico so Jeff Jarrett cannot stay away for too long, and you can never bury a Jarrett. Certainly not Jeff Jarrett. So we got a lot more to get into, including SmackDown tonight, a whole bunch of injury news, best of the Super Juniors, and my thoughts on AEW coming up this Sunday. Wrestling Observer Live. Back on the show, Mike Sempervivi here with you. Wrestling Observer Live on this AEW Double or nothing weekend. The big boss man, Brian Alvarez, out in Las Vegas for all the festivities of not only that show, but everything taking place with the F4W slash Wrestling Observer Convention. As I mentioned earlier on, go over to... uh, Actually, I may have deleted it now, but it's <laughs> F4W uh, Con is the, uh, ha- the the spot on Twitter. Hashtag F4W Con 22 is uh, the hashtag for everything that's going to be taking place there. I assume it's going to be t- uh, the same thing on Instagram. I'm not popular enough to post on Instagram. I've got t- it's t- too, too boring of a life to, to bother with that, except for some pictures at the beach, which I can't go to right now because a massive amount of storms have rolled into Delmarva to just screw up this weekend. So... Nuts to that, but at least I'm not injured. You know, I've had them shaken off the effects of the COVID, but there was a slew of injury news that seemed to come out over the last 24, 48 hours here, according to Dave Meltzer and and PW Insider. And we're going to start with Zelina Vega, who's out of action right now. And, uh, you know, when the the tag team titles got... uh, vacated by Sasha and Naomi walking out. The obvious idea for a lot of people was, well, put Carmella and Zelina back together. You kind of broke them up in a stupid manner anyway, so put them back together and and let them get a run at the tag team titles. And maybe they'll do that at some point, but it's not going to be right away as Zelina has suffered a in-ring injury that required surgery. The injury hasn't been disclosed, but PWI Insider wrote that she is expected to miss the next six to eight weeks. Vega has not wrestled since losing a match to Bianca Belair on the April 11th episode of Raw, although she interfered in Belair's Women's Championship defense against Sonya Deville on April 25th. There has been talk about Vega receiving a push upon her return, as sources have noted her willingness to do what is requested of her and her hard work has been noticed behind the scenes, said PW Insider. Hmm. Dave Meltzer reported in the Wrestling Observer Newsletter that Omega will not be in town for this weekend's pay-per-view. Kenny Omega went to a couple of tapings in the last few weeks to work backstage, but in hindsight, the travel was too early for the healing needed for his injuries, and he won't be in Las Vegas this week for the pay-per-view show, Meltzer wrote. It was reported in March that Omega was recovering from arthroscopic knee surgery and was scheduled to for surgery to repair a sports hernia later that month. Uh, Meltzer goes on to write, quote, 
Omega did say that the parts of his body that are healthy, he is able to train well and is pushing himself harder every week. Other parts, the healing is slow. He is said to be resigned to the fact that physically he will never be 100%, but he is looking at reversing some of the physical damage and being able to return, and this time off in fixing up his different injuries would extend his time as an effective pro wrestler. It's a lot of words to say that Kenny is going to do whatever he can to try to rest and reverse the effects of his injuries so he can keep on in this crazy business. Omega has not performed since dropping the AEW World Championship to Hangman Page at full gear on November 13th, 2021. So Kenny Omega still on the comeback trail. And all the best to AEW's Layla Hirsch, who revealed Thursday that she suffered a torn ACL last month. Uh, It's going to put her on the shelf for a few months, obviously. The injury happened during a match that she was being taped for Dark Elevation on April 6th against Christina Marie. She injured the knee on a moonsault out of the corner when she landed, and the match was stopped and, of course, never aired. Prior to the injury, Hirsch defeated Red Velvet on the March 23rd episode of Dynamite. There was a post-match angle angle where Chris Statlander saved Red Velvet when Hirsch would not let go of an arm bar. Hirsch also defeated Ella Envy on the April 4th edition of Dark Elevation. So all the best to her. AEW ratings news because you got to have a show with ratings, folks. Wednesday's Double or Nothing Go Home edition of Dynamite averaged 929,000 viewers on TBS, up 0.8% from last week. Best audience for the show since April 20th. Dynamite finished six on cable in the uh, 18 to 49 demo, drawing a 0.35 in that category, up 6.1% from last week, and also the best number for the show since April 20th. Dynamite was the top show on cable, not related to the NBA or the NHL, as playoff coverage continues to just dominate the cable charts. ESPN averaged 6.4 million viewers, and TNT 1.4 million viewers for the Celtics Heat and St. Louis Blues Colorado avalanche games uh, respectively there so it is uh it's still a lot to deal with and when we talk about double or nothing a little later on i'll remind you of a story from yesterday about how tony khan is dealing with the uh eastern conference finals between boston and miami if there happens to be a game seven on sunday and rampage is tonight that's the final tv obviously before double or nothing except for the uh the special hype episode uh which is going to be airing the the special i'm sure there's double or nothing special airing right I'm not looking at the chat right now, so somebody can let me know that one. But if that doesn't air, this is going to be the last thing you see in its entirety before Sunday. It's going to air at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Time, 3.30 on the West Coast. So if you're listening to this on the West Coast feed, I I won't spoil you because it hasn't aired on the East Coast yet. (laughs) And it's... It's already aired for you, so you've already spoiled yourself or something like that. But the Young Bucks are going to be wrestling. Matt da- uh, Brian Danielson is going to be wrestling Matt Seidel. William Regal is going to be on commentary for the match, it's going to be obviously playing into the fact that Danielson is hurt after his leg got stuck between the ring and the uh, and the ramp. Uh, a couple weeks ago, the Jericho Appreciation Society went after it this past Wednesday, so facing a high flyer in Matt Seidel uh, surely is going to play into uh, some of the story going on here with Brian Danielson. TNT champion Scorpio Sky will be giving a new custom-made championship belt by Dan Lambert, and wherever Scorpio Sky and Ethan Page and Dan Lambert are, you can probably place a pretty good bet on Ty Conti and Sammy Guevara and of course now Frankie Kazarian being somewhere close by. I hope they do not add that match, and I can't believe they're going to add that match to Sunday's show. Any match between uh, a mixed tag or anything that's going to take place with Paige Van Zandt being involved in that mix too, I hope they hold that off for LA at the Forum. There just does not need to be another match added to that show. There's already 10 matches for Sunday, and that is more than enough. Also tonight... Of course, Ruby Soho, Chris Statlander, Owen Hart Foundation tournament semifinal match with the winner going on to face Britt Baker on Sunday. So, as I mentioned, we'll get into that a little bit more later on. Colt Cabana's future uh, appears to be with Ring of Honor, as Dave Remeltzer reported in the Wrestling Observer Newsletter that Cabana 
has signed a new contract, uh, which is something that the Young Bucks pushed for. But rather than continuing to perform in AEW, Cabana is expected to be part of a relaunched ROH brand if and when that happens. And this may be due, Dave writes, to the longstanding issues that exist between Cabana and CM Punk which has not been mentioned directly by Adam Page, but one who has known the situation with CM Punk and some of his co-workers and his friendships, in this case with Colt Cabana, again, part of the things that I think they wanted to weave into the Adam Page story that I don't know if they made clear enough to maybe the average viewer who doesn't know about a lot of the backstage shenanigans that go on in, in, in relationships that go on involved in pro wrestling. But Dave writes that, quote, this may be in some form related to his issues with CM Punk. Cabana was signed to a new contract. Well, I'm just going ahead and reading what they had already mentioned there, what I already mentioned. But uh, the issues with Punk and Cabana stem from the fact that WWE Dr. Chris Amon filed a lawsuit against the pair in 2018. And uh, Cabana filing suit uh, against Punk, saying that uh, Punk would cover Cabana's legal portion of the proceedings because... Because the conversation that Punk and Cabana had, which led to Amon suing him, took place on Colt Cabana's podcast. So uh, Cabana and, and Punk and the Punk ended up filing a countersuit off of that as well. And the two sides settled that out of court in September of 2019. But obviously... Four years later, there are still issues there. So Cabana's appeared on a couple of ROH shows so far, so... Again, maybe if if again, I don't, I don't know if you want to directly mention Cabana and in in CM Punk, and nor do I think either one of those guys would have want that said directly on AEW television. I think uh, some of the hinting again probably could have been a lot better for this match coming up between CM Punk and Hangman Adam Page, and that World Championship match takes place Sunday, double or nothing. I think Hangman Page re 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 retains the title. I do, as I, I stutter along there. I think I do, at least. Maybe I was stuttering because uh, part of me thinks CM Punk should win that title. And in fact, I think CM Punk would be a very strong champion right now. And I think him winning would be a, a really good thing for the company. Is it good for Hangman Adam Page? No. Is it a bad thing for the company if Hangman Adam Page retains the title? No. Not at all. And in fact, you can build to a second match. In fact, you can build maybe a little bit towards CM Punk being annoyed, maybe by some of the things that Hangman Adam Page is saying about him, and maybe taking a, a harder look at the locker room, some of the people that may have been nice to him and shook his hand and looked him in the eye uh, when he got there, maybe saying some things behind his back or when he's not around, some of the people that Hangman Adam Page may be talking about, maybe that's a good way to get to a second match between the two, and I think that's the direction I would go with that. I, I really, really do. Uh, because I think Hangman Adam Page needs more as a champion. I, I, I do. And I know his work inside the ring is always strong. He's been a strong in-ring world champion. That's cool. But I still don't think when you think about Kenny Omega, when you think about uh, Chris Jericho, John Moxley, CM Punk, Brian Danielson, when you think of that star power, when you think of champions i don't think he's there yet and that's okay it really really is but i think a good win over cm punk in a great match which i expect him to have i think that's going to go a long way for him and i think continuing this feud between the two i think that's a great idea too so i know we're pushing up against break here so i will go through the rest of the card when we get back as well as some other events taking place this weekend and my thoughts on the New Japan Best of the Super Juniors, which will be coming up as well. My name is Mike Sempervivi. This is Wrestling Observer Live. On the show, WrestlingObserver.com. Wrestling Observer Live, too. <laughs> you can find it at WrestlingObserver.com, where you should be a member. $12.99 a month gets you everything, including the Wrestling Observer newsletter, which I cited and... Get that news from Dave Meltzer directly, the source himself, as opposed to everybody else who just cuts and pastes and gets everything wrong and then puts it up on their timelines and screws everything up and then drives Brian into a, a big tizzy on this show when somebody's in the chat and says something that was reported by Dave, which Brian knows not to be true, and then he freaks out and yells for a, a long time. 
You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> He's in Vegas, though, double or nothing. And I mentioned what I, I, I already mentioned what I, I thought about the AEW World Heavyweight Championship match between Hangman Adam Page and CM Punk. I think. Hangman Adam Page should hold on to the belt right now. I, I, you know, in a perfect world, Hangman Page would already be at a level that I would want him to be at, which is in that upper echelon that I spoke of. And CM Punk could have that belt because he is he's their biggest star. I mean, you could argue him or Brian Danielson. I think it's it's CM Punk, and obviously it's no shade on MJF or anybody else who's on that roster. But CM Punk is a is a legitimate mover here, and I think he'd be a great world champion. But I think we still have a lot more story to go with he and Hangman Adam Page, and I see Page holding on to the title. There is one buy-in match, which is Hook and Danhausen uh, against Tony Nese and Smart Mark Sterling that will take place on the pre-show. And this is another reason that I think they're going to go ahead and hold off on Scorpio Sky and Paige Van Zandt against Ty, and I would assume Ethan Page against Ty, Frankie Kazarian, and uh, Scorpio Sky, and they're going to hold that off for Los Angeles. Is be the reason why is because. Khan noted that he cut back the time uh, on the pre-show uh, to 30 minutes, beginning at 7:30, which really only leaves time for one match, and seemingly would give me the idea that you don't want to overload the crowd and overload the viewer who would be watching 12 matches. You know what I mean? You know, you, again, it's 10 matches is a lot and AEW packs a lot into all their matches. This show is looking to run long anyway, not the, the least of reasons uh, being because they are going to hold off on the main event that I just talked about until possibly after the Boston Miami game ends. If there is a NBA game coming up on Sunday, they are going to hold off on the start of that match until the basketball game is over. So it could be a long night, and that's another reason to not go ahead and add any match with Scorpio Sky. That is for sure. But Hook and Danhausen, surely going to get a quick and easy victory over Tony Nese and Smart Mark Sterling. Maybe not easy, obviously. you got to let Nice and Sterling get some heat and, of course, do that all on Danhausen. They better not get any heat at all on Hook, who only needs to save the day here and uh, not have any of his hair go out of place and make it to the back uh, as a hero that he is for everybody out there. AEW Women's World Championship, Thunder Rosa and Serena Deeb. I have a feeling this is going to be... Unfortunately, the match with probably the least crowd heat, but will be one of the best matches to take place in the ring. I think Thunder Rose's title reign has not gone off uh, very well so far. I just think they've had some missteps. The stuff that happened with uh, Vicky Guerrero and Nyla Rose and that whole deal, and she just... She just has not been where she should be in the ring and how she is presented uh, at a level the way she was before she won the championship. And I hope they can turn that around. I'm sure she and Serena Deeb can have a great, great match inside the ring. So I hope uh, they do. And I hope the fans take to it as well, too. There's a lot, like I mentioned, there's a lot on this show and there's going to be points where the fans come down. And unfortunately for Thunder Rose and Serena Deeb, I have a feeling that that's one of the matches where that could happen. Hopefully I'm wrong, but we'll see. AEW World Tag Team Championship, Jungle Boy and Luchasaurus alongside Christian Cage against Powerhouse Hobbs and Ricky Starks against Keith Lee and Swerve Strickland. I'm a lot more interested in this match after the three-way between Jungle Boy, Ricky Starks, and Swerve on Wednesday night. That kind of jazzed me back into this match and actually caring a little bit more about this match. I got to be honest, the heavyweight side of this, I'm only really interested in powerhouse Hobbs out of these three guys. So I'm sure we're going to get a lot of, I mean, a lot of crazy double team maneuvers, guys flying everywhere. Luchasaurus and Keith Lee, obviously for their size, they love to fly, <laughs> you know, it's, it, fly as much as they can. That torneo by Keith Lee on Wednesday night was a, uh, we don't need to be seeing a whole lot more of that. And I damn see, damn sure don't need to see powerhouse Hobbs coming off the top rope. But I think all these three teams together, are going to be throwing it all at the wall. And it's probably going to be, to me, it's tough because the House of Black against the Death Triangle is probably going to be of the tag matches. You know, that that's probably going to be the best one inside the ring. But this has the opportunity to be uh, a show stealer in some ways. I mean, with all again, with all this great stuff, that that six man, uh, that, that three way for the tag titles may end up kind of stealing some of the spotlight from somebody. 
Jay Cargill and Anna Jay. I expect this to be relatively short. I know Jade has already gone through Anna Jay relatively quickly uh, for the TBS championship. That would probably, and Anna Jay talking about the fact she's learned a lot from the veterans and all that sort of stuff. Maybe, you know, they, they add a couple more minutes onto it, but I think the shorter, the better this way. I think Anna Jay losing a match, as long as she doesn't embarrass herself or get embarrassed in any way, you know, losing a short match isn't the worst idea in the world. And the, that's where Jade Cargill obviously shines the best. So hopefully this ends up being a quick one with Jade picking up the victory as she continues on with the TBS championship. Young Bucks and the Hardys. This is a match that, in hindsight, with that being 2020, they should have done right off the bat with the Hardys getting back together in uh, AEW. I just, they, Jeff and Matt look like the, I'm not saying the road has owned them, although part of, you know, part of the build to this whole thing has been we have taken, you know, we were raised the same way. We took two divergent paths uh, in the wrestling business because the wrestling business was, was different back then. But all of that time, all of the bumps, everything, it, look, Jeff and and, and Matt, uh, they have given all they, they need to give to this business. They owe it nothing. They own all of the viewers nothing here. And uh, they don't owe the Young Bucks anything either here in this match. But I think with with the what the Young Bucks standards are, you know, and what their fans expect out of their matches, this may end up being a little bit disappointing because I'm not sure how much the Hardys can do with all the best intentions in the world. You know, I'm not sure how this match is going to be, but... I'm not sure how much I want to see with the Hardys after this, to be real honest with you, Uh, because in the times that I've seen them leading into this, you know, Jeff landing like a a sack of flour on everybody, you know, falling off the top shelf when it comes to with Swantons and uh, and just Matt has had a lot of (laughs) rough goes of it at times in AEW. I I would hope this is shorter rather than longer, but I know it's a dream match for the Young Bucks, so we'll have to see what happens. As I mentioned earlier, Death Triangle against uh, House of Black. This is, on paper, I want to call it a show stealer, but we haven't seen much of Pac or anything like that recently, and they have not, with everything else going on, I'm not saying that they've... You know, this has kind of fallen behind a little bit as far as the promotion of of matches goes on this show. And I guess by that definition, it could steal the the show. But I expect fully on paper, when you look at the guys involved in this, this is going to be a hot, hot match. So uh, my expectations are high for this. I think it's going to be one of the best matches of the night. And House of Black is undefeated so far. We haven't seen Pac for a while. They can use that as part of the story if he ends up being the one who takes the loss. But I think the House of Black comes out victorious anarchy in the arena the jericho appreciation society against eddie kingston santana ortiz john moxley and brian danielson it's going to be entertaining i can guarantee that with the people that are involved in it there's going to be a high level of violence Enough comedy, hopefully not too much comedy, but I think there's going to be some, again, with when you have Danielson and Jericho and Kingston and Moxley and Regal being involved and in setting up these matches, and, and that's no shade against anybody else, you know, Daniel Garcia or Santana Ortiz, any of those guys, when you have those brains together to put together a match, I hopefully they don't overdo it. But I think it could end up being really, really fun. Jericho's got to get his comeuppance. Maybe it's maybe it's by way of a fireball. You you never know if he's going to take some time off or something like that. I don't know if Fozzie's got a summer touring schedule or anything like that. But Eddie Kingston has got to get revenge on Chris Jericho. And I will bet if Brian Danielson is not injured, which I don't believe that he really is too badly injured maybe a bruise on that ankle or something like that i i think that'll play into some things too as he stomps somebody into the ground during the match but eddie kingston santana ortiz moxley and danielson i think get the victory there mjf and wardlow wardlow talked to the new york post about mjf and this is what he said when you look at max from a business aspect he's an absolute genius he is one of the hardest working most demanding individuals i have ever seen the aspect of him is truly amazing and truly impressive now with that said as a person he's the scum of the earth i love when people have shoot work promos especially with the that they end up in the media I, i love these things i love the fact that the new york post which is a rag is even covering wrestling with how they've thought about it for so many years here but 
as Wardlow continues, I've seen him disrespect people to unimaginable levels. If you think the things he says on TV in front of millions of people is bad, you should hear the things he says on a private jet or in a limo when it's just a few of the boys. He's not a good person. He also went on to say that he does have some unfinished business over the TNT title and the fact that Max uh, MJF screwed him out of that title. He believes once things are all done and through with Max and he gets a victory coming up on Sunday, he's going to have to bring some peace to his mind over that TNT championship. So could we see Wardlow jump from MJF and dealing with all his cronies to dealing with Scorpio Sky and Dan Lambert and all of his cronies? Hmm? Hmm? May not be the worst idea in the world. It'll still, Wardlow will still be the biggest baby face on that roster, I think, if that happens. Uh, even if it doesn't happen, he's still going to be the biggest baby face on that roster unless you defeat him on Sunday, which they cannot do. There's no reason to get cute about this. It's old pro wrestling booking 101. We've seen a lot of it in this feud anyway. It's really, really simple. MJF and all of his cronies do everything they possibly can, do everything they can, every gimmick, the powder, raising the cage, whatever it is that they decide that they want to do, but o Wardlow overcomes all of it, and he finally gets his revenge, and he stands gloriously over MJF, a free man, to sign a contract with AEW. If you do almost anything else, it, I just, I, I, Why? <laughs> why and i'm going to need convincing on how that can work and to be honest with you i'm not sure i want to hear it wardlow gets the victory that leads me to the owen hart cup final matches samoa joe and adam cole Britt baker against the winner of ruby soho and chris statlander tonight on rampage i think chris statlander is going to take the victory over ruby soho which will continue ruby soho maybe getting uh uh, shade thrown at her by Red Velvet and Jade Cargill about, hey, look, we handed you the notebook. We gave this to you on how to be Chris Statlander, and you threw it away, said this was a new Chris Statlander. Maybe it wasn't a new Chris Statlander, and you lost to her. That's what I think is going to happen in that match, because I believe it's going to be Britt Baker winning. And I know everybody's going to want Adam Cole to win and stand next to Britt Baker, his girlfriend, uh, as glorious champions, but I don't believe it. I think Samoa Joe's going to win the men's side. A couple more notes when we get back from break. Wrestling Observer Live. We're live. A lot of stuff that I didn't even get into on this show. So much going on. Best of the Super Juniors, New Japan. There are three shows left to take place, 10 matches on each show. Very few people have been eliminated so far, although that will change coming up uh, basically tomorrow morning on the, the East Coast uh, time. Uh, Ace Austin from Impact actually leads Block A with 10 points. Uh, El Desperado, a big log jam in Block B. Any number of people could go ahead and take the victory there, but some of the best matches that I have seen have happened recently. Robbie Eagles and El Fantasmo, Hiromu Takahashi and Yo over the last two nights I think have been the two best matches in this tournament so far, and there have been a whole lot of good ones. Only a handful of, of ones that I would consider, you know, Four stars are excellent, but those are definitely two of them. Desperado and Lindemann from Night 7. El Fantasma has been great. Wheeler Yuta has been great. Uh, El Desperado is one of the best professional wrestlers in the world, let alone in, in the junior heavyweight division. And with all of those guys that they have there with Show, with, with unfortunately, there's been a lot of shenanigans with him, but uh, with, with Yo and, and some of the other talent that they have, Hiromu, once he does become a full-time heavyweight, will not be missed in that division. And with the success of Ace Austin, with the success of Alex Zane, with Chris Bay, I'm sure still due to come over, with lots of guys as things open up coming into New Japan, we can still, still see some incredible matches amongst the junior heavyweights in that division. So... A lot. There's going to be a lot taking place, and and I should mention this. I have to mention this. Ed in San Antonio, his show taking place at the Silver Nugget directly after the finish of Dave and Brian's Q and A tomorrow. Going to be around noon Pacific time. Miranda Alize, Christy Janes, Debbie Malenko against Billy Starks, Brittany Blake against Maddie Rinkowski, Ali Catch will be there, Veda Scott will be there, a whole bunch of people will be there, and you should be there too if you're in Las Vegas. As I mentioned, F4W con on twitter the hashtag f4wcon22 go ahead and use that 
as a, as I run out of breath here, the perfect time for this show to end. Thank you to producer Jared. Thank you to producer Daniel. My name is Mike Sempervivi, and I will talk to you again after a while.